we're ready to start considering our divisions of gymnosperms. Everything up to now has been true pretty much of all four divisions of gymnosperms that we'll do. So the gymnosperms are not a monophyletic group. So these four divisions whose names I'm gonna write here are not, not form a monophyletic group, but each one individually is monophyletic. So the first one, the cycadophyta, is a monophyletic, is a monophyletic group. The Ginkophyta is monophyletic. In fact, Ginkophyta only there's only a single extant species of Ginkophyta now. The Coniferophyta, these are the ones that you know the best. These are the cone-bearing plants like the pines. And the last one, the really strange one, a strange one, well, in a lot of ways strange, but it's got a strange name. How would you pronounce that? Yeah, you wouldn't pronounce the G, Nidophyta. So the genus is Nidum. It's a melee name. One of the words, one of the few root words in science that does not come from English. Cycadophyta. The root, cyca, means palm, but these are not palms. Palms are angiosperms. These are gymnosperms, but they have palm-like leaves. And so their name, cycadophyta, comes from the fact that they resemble palms, palm-like plants. <clears throat> Here is one, this is a part of the plant. We'll show you the whole plant in a minute here. This is a male cone or a microstrobilus. And that's something we haven't seen before. We have seen always up till now that when there's a strobilus, it contains both micro and mega sporophylls, micro megasporangia, et cetera. This is a different case. It does not have mega anything on it. It's got only micro sporophylls, only microsporangia on there. So we're gonna to start to see, you know, I don't wanna say a separation of the sexes because these aren't really sexes, right? I mean, the sexes occur in the gametophytes. But these are the plants, the diploid plants, that are gonna bear the sporocytes that are going to produce the gametophytes, which is where sex occurs. So they're, and these are being separated. The sporocytes are being separated in some of these cases. So in this case, we have a, we could say, well, I hate to say a male plant, but you know what I'm, you know what I mean. It's not correct, but I don't have another word for it. A plant that bears only microstroboli, a microsporangia plant, if you will. So these are microsporophylls. And if we looked under there, we would find microsporangia bearing pollen grains. The leaves are large and compound. So there are large compound leaves. looking somewhat superficially palm-like. And the plants now are, as I've said already, are what are called dioecious. You know the roots, di, two, ecious, house. So two houses, meaning they are separated into the plants that have the microstroboli and the plants that have the megastroboli. The alternative to dioecious is monoecious or monoecious, we say. Mon one house. So Selaginella is monoecious. It has a single strobola, a single plant, both kinds of sporophylls. Single strobilus, both kinds of sporophylls. It's going to get a little more complex than monoecious and dioecious when we get into the angiosperms, but this is our first pass at the 
weird sexuality that we're going to find in the angiosperms. Angiosperms are going to violate pretty much every rule that we've talked about in the class. Just because it's such 250,000 or 300,000 maybe angiosperms, and when there's ever when there's that much diversity, that many different plants, they've exploited all kinds of different habitats and different niches, and there's a huge diversity in structure and function. Here is a cycad. This is there are tropical or semi-tropical plants. In the United States, they are starting to grow up in North Carolina. There's nothing native above Florida. There's nothing native above Southern Florida. But if you go to the coast now in South, uh, North Carolina, I'm not sure how far north you can find them. You might be able to find them up to the north of the North Carolina border. Planting, you'll find cycads planted. There. So they're becoming relatively popular around new developments along the coast. They're not along the older developments. This is one that's growing in southern Florida at Fairchild Tropical Garden. This is a tropical member. It's not native to the United States. Uh, the size of this is maybe six feet like that. And we see here this is a female cone or a megastrobolic cone. So there would be separate, for a better word, male and female plants. Again, you can see superficially palm-like plants, compound leaves. The stems are thick and fleshy. They have secondary growth. <clears throat> But that secondary growth it doesn't produce wood, it produces a very soft tissue. So it's kind of, it's fibrous kind of tissue. Here's a really nice drawing of the male and female cones of a number of species. This is by my favorite botanical artist, uh, retired and actually not too long deceased, unfortunately now. Her name was Patric Patricia Fawcett and she worked for Fairchild Tropical Garden while I was a postdoc there quite a while ago. You can see why I like her. They're really beautiful drawings. This is the female. I'm gonna call them fe male and female. I'm giving up. Now, you just gotta know, right? These are diploid plants. So they're gonna bear the structures. They're gonna have the sex organs. Not, they do not have sex organs directly. So that's one species, male and female. Here again, female, male different species. Um, these are actually, I think these are both female here, this one and that one. And then there are a bunch down here, there are just a lot of seeds from different species. So I'll give you some idea of some of the diversity. It's even more diverse. A, the group is even more diverse than this. Here again is a microstrobolus. <laughs> And so each of those sporophylls is a microsporophyll. And they will have microsporangia. <coughs> and pollen grains. We're going to start to see some of the genera now that we're going to be responsible for. This is the genus Zamia. It is the only genus that's native to the United States. It is native only from southern Florida. Wouldn't have gotten beyond up north. I mean, Fort Lauderdale is about the farthest north it would occur naturally. As I say, these things are planted now in other places, but that natively it wouldn't have gotten beyond that. This side is the uh, male side of the line, and this is the female side. And now we can see that these sporophylls here do not look very leaf-like. That's a characteristic of Zamia. There are sporophylls in other genera that are look much more leaf-like, but in this case, they're not. So here's a microsporophyll. Here it is again. These are the microsporangia.
On the female side, these are the ovules. This is a megasporophyll. You notice that in both cases, the sporophylls are peltate, umbrella shape. And they've got, especially in the female shape, it's peltate. In the male, it's not quite as clear, but in the female shape, it's really peltate with the ovules hanging down toward the axis. A microstrobilis again. I think that's upside down. Inside there, these are the microsporangia. Born on the microsporophylls. And again, I think this is Zamia. Again, this one was taken in lab. We're looking down from underneath toward the top of the microstrobilus. Here are the microsporangia. And this is a microsporophyll. So you can see many microsporangia there. You can also see, I think, here, you know, in some of the other, you can see little dehiscence lines where the sporangia are going to open up and shed the pollen grains. This is a different genus, microsporophylls again, a little more leaf-like here. Microsporangia on the lower surface. Here's the pollen grain. So we can look now in the structure of the pollen grain a little more deeply than we've looked before. There are, in this case, three cells. In the pollen grain when it's shed. And the first one of those, this big one, at the bottom is called the tube cell. And that's going to form the pollen tube. This cell at the upper end here, single cell up here, that is the prothallial cell. Remember the name prothallus? It is the, I mean, you could say it's the remnant of the whole gametophyte. Remember that whole heart-shaped gametophyte in the ferns, or some of you are just going to see it today. This is equivalent to all of those sterile cells. It's been reduced now over evolutionary time, not reduced developmentally or anything like that, but we talk about an evolutionary reduction in the male gametophyte, female gametophyte too, but here it's really, really incredibly reduced in the male gametophyte, and we have one in this case, one sterile cell. It represents the sterile gametophyte. And then we still have to get the sperm, and the sperm are going to come from this middle cell here, which is the generative cell. So in general, I'm not going to give you a diagram of, of pollen grain and ask you to label the cells. But you should know that this, in this group, it's three-celled when it's shed because it's just these numbers of, pollen, um, of cells in the pollen grain when the pollen grain is shed are pretty distinctive for the different divisions. So in this case, three when it's shed. And you should know that the generative cell gives rise to the 
sperm. Now, it doesn't give rise to the sperm directly. But there is a division that produces, uh, there's an intermediate cell here, I've forgotten the name of it. In this way, the sperm. Again, I'm never going to ask you to draw out a diagram like this. I am just making the point that the generative cell does not give rise to the sperm directly. There's a several, there's a couple cell divisions, two, in fact, to get the sperm. Generative cells haploid, the sperm are haploid. There's a couple cell divisions intermediate between the production of the, those two. So there's a little bit of growth of the gametophyte is what we're saying here. Not very much, but there's a little bit of growth of the gametophyte. Here's a female plant. So this is the fleshy stem. The compound leaves. And this is the megastrobolus. Zamia again. Genus Zamia. Here's one's cut open, Omega Strobilis again. Omega Sporophylls, again, they're palpate, they don't look very leaf like. The ovules born on the megasporophylls. And of course, that's the integument you see on the outside of the ovules. This is a portion of a, another kind of megasporophyll. Let me show you the whole megasporophyll on the next slide first. So here's a megasporophyll. This is a cycas, another genus. This is the genus that you find planted around condos on the coast now up in North Carolina, as far north, maybe even as Virginia. It's got a leaf-like portion. Not really leaf-like, but more leaf-like than zamia. And then it, down here below that, it's got the ovules. So there's an ovule bearing portion and a leaflet portion. Now let's go back. We're going to look at this portion. The last slide has just this portion shown. So there's the megasporophyll. Here's an ovule. And let me get. A highlighter color. I am highlighting here the integument. So this outer covering that we're seeing here around the ovule is the integument. You can see there's a little lip up here at the top of the integument. That encloses the hole. So that hole is the micropile. It says micropile. So through there, that's how the pollen grain is going to enter. Here we have again our cycas. This is cycas. Now bearing seeds. So the seeds have tremendously enlarged. Here's a couple unfertilized ovules. Going on the other side. Very leaf like compared to Zamia. When you see the cone,
the female cone, it doesn't look like a cone as much as we find in Xenia. It's got a much more open appearance. And perhaps you've seen these when you go down to the coast in North Carolina, you've seen these and things that haven't known what they are. That cone is going to fall apart. It doesn't persist like that. The, as the seeds mature, it will eventually fall apart. The megasporophylls will fall off. The other thing that's shown here is are some other species. So we have, on this last diagram, two species of cycas. These are the megasporophylls, of course. Of course, there's one zamia. And these are other species. And we'll see this one, we'll see that one in lab. It's the genus is Dioan. But so there's this variation within the types of megasporophylls and the types of microsporophylls we have, some being very leaf-like, some being not leaf-like. And we have our two required plants have that extreme, zamia and cycas. Another view of the same kinds of things we've been studying. This is Zamia again. A megastrobolus. Megasporophylls. Here also, and ovules. And again, you look there at the tip, you can see the little projection that surrounds the micropile. With any luck, we'll be able to see those mature in lab. Often, we have often, in the last few years, had these mature in lab. Now we've got to find all of these parts in a real cross-section or longitudinal section of an ovule. So what we're seeing here now is a relatively young ovule of Cycasozamia, I think this is Zamia. And we're going to go through and find all the different parts that we've been talking about, and in fact, find some new parts that we haven't talked about, but parts that are going to play an important role in pollination. So let's start with this at the center. And at the very center, we have the mega gametophyte. Now, the megagametophyte will have two archegonia and two eggs in it, but they're not shown in this diagram, so I'm just going to draw them in so you'll know that they would be about at this level. And the archegonia and the eggs. So the white line would be the archegonium, and the squiggle line, that would be where the egg is. In the center. <coughs> archegonia is very yeah, we won't have time to look at it today, but next time we will show you that. The surrounding this, the megaspore is gone by now, so we have the megasporangium. And outside the megasporangium, we have multiple layers here of the integument. Here we have it's closed in this diagram, but this would have been the micropile. That's all things we know. The two things we don't know are cavities. Here is one cavity. Here is a second cavity. I'm going to switch colors and label those. This chamber here is called the pollination chamber. It's called that because that's where the pollen grain is going to land when it comes into the ovule. Pollen's got to get inside there. The sperm's got to get inside this thing to get to the archegonia. It's going to first land there, the pollination chamber. This chamber down here is called the archegonial chamber. And that's going to be where the sperm swim to get to the archegonium. So with this introduction, and we're going to do this again, we're going to look at all of these same structures again in another diagram. 
with this introduction, we're getting ready to understand how fertilization takes place in the gymnosperms, and that'll prepare us for it in the angiosperms. Where we left off really last time was labeling the parts of an ovule. A little bit later than the time of pollination, this is more, more toward the time of embryo formation, but we can see all the parts of the ovule that we want to see here, and so we're going to label it again as, our, as a way of starting. And we'll start at the inside of the ovule with our megagametophyte. And I'm just going to use red for that for now. <coughs> and in that megagametophyte, we would find the archegonia, which are not shown here. It's actually, as I say, a little later stage of development, but this is good for us to get oriented. There would be two archegonia about here. And as I've talked about, and as you'll see in the next slides, those archegonia are really only kind of one cell thick, one cell layer thick. And there'd be a little neck at the top of those leading up to this chamber that we'll label in a second. The egg is inside those archegonia, and these are the eggs. So that's that. structure inside the archegonium. Let's move to the megasporangium next. And this structure that runs all the way around like this is the megasporangium. You can see at the top here, the tip toward the micropile is quite thick. And that's actually significant that it's thick at that end. And we'll come back to that. And then it runs around and surrounds the megagametophyte. That's pretty dark. That wasn't good. I don't think I can <coughs> reproduce that. So we're just going to label this off on the side again, the megasporangium. Outside the megasporangium, the next covering we have is the integument. Let's just leave it gray and say that this is the integument. It looks like there's two layers. There, we go. there are multiple layers to the integument. Yep. So that whole thing is the integument. So these things will have a structure when the when the integument matures. It'll have a structure, and that will those two layers will become you know, not that they're not functional here, but they will have another function in the mature seed. So both the integument and the megasporangium have a couple layers in them. So this leaves us now with these two cavities. One between the integument and the megasporangium, and one between the megasporangium and the archegonium. 
So here's the first of those cavities. And that one is the pollination chamber. Because the pollen grain is going to come to lie there. The pollen grain is going to get drawn inside the ovule and it's going to come and lie at that, in that chamber. When it's drawn in, it comes through the micropyle and through the integument, we have the micropyle running. So that is, as I say, it's a little older ovule and so it's closed up a little bit here but it would be open at the time of pollination when the pollen is going to be drawn through that micropyle. We'll be talking about that as we go on. So that's the pollination chamber. Down inside the pollination chamber, we have this area. It's the only color that looks better on your screen than it does on mine. And that is the archegonial chamber. <clears throat> because it lies down there next to the archegonium. And in fact, the necks of the necks on the archegonium lead right up into that chamber. So this is a, a space, and this is a space. That kind of peach color is a space, and the blue color here is a space. So what's going to happen in the process of fertilization is that our pollen grain is going to get low, drawn down here into the pollination chamber, and it's at that point that it germinates. So the pollen germinates in the pollination chamber. <coughs> and it forms the pollen tube. In fact, that's what this is here. This area, that's the pollen tube. The pollen tube is now going to digest its way through the megasporangium. It's going to actually take nutrients from the megasporangium. So this, this is a nutritive tissue in a way for the pollen tube, nutritive in the sense that the pollen tube digests its way, it secretes enzymes and takes up nutrients from the megasporangium. It's going to then reach the archegonial chamber. And at that place, the sperm are released. The sperm are mobile, and they're released into the archegonial chamber. They swim and fertilize the egg. So it's a pretty amazing system. We're going to go over it more, more times. We're not doing it just this once. It's a pretty amazing system. And it exists, or it's an adaptation for drought resistance. Because now the sperm are released into this little chamber, the archegonial chamber, that's fluid filled, and they're not dependent on environmental water. So the ovule then is a little chamber, I mean, a little container that allows that archegonial chamber to be protected from any desiccation of the environment. We still have mobile sperm in this first couple of groups of gymnosperms we're going to study, and that mobile sperm swims then in the archegonial <coughs> chamber. When we get to the angiosperms, we're going to we'll find out that the sperm are no longer mobile. We're going to completely do away with water in those groups, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why the angiosperms are so effective. Not only is they, have they got adaptations for drought resistance like this, but they completely do away with the need for any type of free water. The sperm do not swim in those groups. Let's go on and look at this again in another um, slide. Label them again, label the structures again. This is a little younger ovule here. This really does show the archegonia. So I'm going to go through and label the same things again. As I said, the archegonium is really just a single layer around the outside. So that is the archegonium, that red line. In the center there,
This is the egg <coughs> surrounded by the archegonium. And then the chamber above that, this chamber here, that's our archegonial chamber. Outside the archegonial chamber, we have, of course, the megasporangium. You see in this earlier stage of development, the megasporangium is a little bit less well-developed. And growing down through the megasporangium already at this stage, we can see that there are pollen tubes. So here are, this is a pollen tube just starting to grow down through the megasporangium. Outside the megasporangium, we have the place where the pollen grain landed. And in fact, you know, we could have drawn or we would have seen in a slightly different section actually a pollen grain sitting there. <coughs> this area. A pollination chamber. And outside the pollination chamber, the integument. Through the integument we would see, although it's not shown in this slide, the micropile would run. So if it was there, it would be in that area. So if we compare this picture with the last one, which is actually a little later stage in development, you can see that the integument has thickened, the megasporangium has thickened, and well, the magnifications are very different. You can't see them. The gametophyte has also grown. So the whole thing is growing during this time. So what's happening then is that the pollen tube is growing down through the megasporangium at the same time the megasporangium is enlarging. So there is a period of time where the pollen tube has not reached the archegonium and the whole structure is still enlarging. It takes a number of months for that process to take place. Here's an enlargement just of, here's the egg. Here is the archegonium and that's what I really want you to see here is that there, that single layer of cells of the archegonium This is the megagametophyte. And this is the archegonial chamber. <coughs> Here it is in a not very good diagram, but I'm going to use this diagram after we label it to talk a little more about the process of pollination and fertilization. We'll do that, look at that again. So let's just look at the structures again. Here we have the female gametophyte at the center, which is what we're calling a little more technically the megagametophyte. <coughs> the archegonium isn't really labeled correctly here. What they've got labeled the archegonium is really the egg. Let's fix that. There's the archegonium, and here is the egg in the center. <coughs> the egg in the lighter brown. I don't like this term nucellus. It's a term, uh, well, I'm not going to go into the history. Let's just say we're not going to use it in this class. It's the megasporangium. <coughs> it's just another name for the megasporangium. And you won't like, it's unlikely you're going to see it very often. What's not shown is the archegonial chamber. So we should have here, I say it's not a very good diagram. There should be here. the archegonial chamber. Let's put it in. Outside the megasporangium, the pollination chamber, that's in. The micropile is in. And now we see another structure that's uh, ephemeral structure. It's not a 
doesn't have a cellular nature, and that is what's called the pollination droplet. And there we have the pollination droplet. So let's talk about that pollination droplet now. The pollination droplet is a little droplet of kind of, of sticky fluid, also with some um, amino acids and nutrients in it. It's secreted by the integument. Oh, we didn't label the integument. It's not even labeled on here, is it? Let's do that. There's the integument. It's secreted by the integument, and it's produced at the time when the pollen is transferred. So the pollen's going to be transferred from the female cone to the male cone. I'll talk about that transfer process in a minute. Once it gets into the female cone, it gets stuck on that pollination droplet. And the pollination droplet is then pulled back into the ovule. So this, then, with the pollen on it, gets pulled back into the ovule. And we have the pollen grain. I'll use another color for that. So our pollen grains then come to lie on top of the megasporangium. <coughs> and the pollen tube begins to grow out. Pollen tube can branch. It can do all kinds of crazy things, but it slowly is going to make its way down toward the archegonial chamber. So the pollen tube then is growing down through the megasporangium, and it's carrying the sperm with it as it does that. Eventually, it's going to get to the archegonial chamber, and it's going to release the sperm into the water of the archegonial chamber, where our mobile sperm are going to swim and accomplish fertilization. So that's the process that leads to fertilization. Now again, an adaptation to remove the need for environmental water. What we haven't talked about is how the pollen grain gets from the male female cone Sorry, the male cone to the female cone. <coughs> now, I don't think I've got next. I'm sure I don't have next a, a female cone. We're going to look at the process of pollination, of um, fertilization again in just a second, but let's first talk about this process of transfer of pollen. The transfer of the pollen then is called the process of pollination. I'm going to call it the male cone to the female cone. And we should probably really rather say microstrobilus to megastrobilus, but I'm being a little sloppy here. So the male to the female cone. In plants as general, there's a lot of different ways that this happens. We're just talking about cycadophyta now, so we'll talk about the most common way in the cycadophyta. This is this transfer is mediated by beetles in cycadophyta. Now remember, like in things like zamia, and even in cycas, remember those um, megasporophylls are very fleshy. There's a lot of material there, and so they provide a food reward for the beetles. So when the, as the cone matures, the megasporophylls and the microsporophylls separate from each other slightly. And that allows the entrance of the beetles into the combs. So on the male side, let's start there, the beetles come in and they crawl around in there and they eat pollen and they eat the cones a little bit. And you know, when you're out having a good time and there's lots of food and lots of friends there, what do you, would you normally just naturally want to do? Well, maybe not you, but if you were a beetle, <clears throat> Yeah, you would do that. What is it? Yes, it's sex. <laughs> it's a big, a big orgy inside the male cone. And then they fly out of that and get attracted to the female cones, where there's, well, you know what's going on in the female cones, probably too, um, and food rewards also. And in that process, they carry pollen all over their bodies. 
And so they are now in the male female cone with the pollination droplets and some of the pollen gets washed off on there and then drawn into the ovule. So the transfer of pollen is mediated in this case by um, beetles, by insects. And for a long time, it was thought that this kind of beetle pollination represented the most primitive kind, the most ancestral type of pollination mechanism. We have a slightly more nuanced view of that today, um, but it is certainly a very old kind of mechanism because the cycads are a very old group. <coughs> Once inside the, the ovule, and here is the ovule again. Now we look at, start at that middle picture. <coughs> So here is the ovule, and we can see the, labeled incorrectly again, the archegonium. The archegonial chamber. The megasporangium with pollen tubes growing through it. And here's the pollination chamber. And then the integument. and the micropile, the hole by, through which the pollen is going to be drawn. Megasprangium and female gametophyte, of course, are also here. The picture on top is an enlargement of this area. Okay, so we've just taken that area and enlarged it. So you can see on the top then, we have the archegonia, the female gametophyte, archegonia, female gametophyte, archegonial chamber. There's the megasporangium. And what is mainly shown here, what we want you to see, is the pollen tube. There's our pollen tube. There's several of them there. Those little cells inside the pollen tube are the sperm, or the cells which are going to divide to form the sperm. So there's our pollen tubes. So you see the pollen tube is grown through the megasporangium and it's just at the stage where it's going to release the pollen, um, the, the sperm, but just going to release the sperm into the archegonial chamber, which can then swim and fertilize the egg. On the bottom we have the sperm and the egg removed from the archegonial chamber. So you can see those separately. So the pollen tube then is a sperm delivery mechanism. It delivers the sperm through the, arc, through the megasporangium to the archegonial chamber. I'm not going to label this one. You should be able to go back. This is for you. So you should be able to label all the parts that are in that photograph of a young ovule. Here's the sperm again. Some light micrographs. Now not quite as fantastically interesting sperm in this case. And here we have our seed, a young seed. And let's find the parts of it. So we said that at the center of the young seed, we have a nutritive tissue. And in this case, that nutritive tissue is the megagametophyte. So the megagametophyte at the center then is going to provide the nutrition for the young embryo. All of these things, this is all embryo. 
These are the parts of the embryo. And we'll learn those parts later on when we do one, in one of our other groups. For now, we're just not gonna worry about that. We've got enough <coughs> new things. We'll learn the parts of the embryo later. But that's our young embryo after the zygote was formed. The megasporangium is now very small. There's only a little tiny bit of it left here. And this red area is what I'm showing that is megasporangium. So after fertilization, the megasporangium stops growing and we just get a little remnant of it in the mature seed. Everything outside that megasporangium, all of this, it's got layers on it, but that doesn't matter. All of this, this is all integument. And now it's not called the integument anymore because it's matured into the seed coat. So this is all seed coat. And in the cycads, it's fleshy. It can have slightly different layers in it, but it's a fleshy seed coat. And I'll put in parentheses here, integument. So you remember that it develops from the integument. It's the mature integument surrounding for that. So that's it, that's the part, those are then the parts of the seed. This is all here, that's all layers of the integument, or seed coat. And we're not gonna learn the names for the different layers. Here's what it looks like if you were to just look at it externally. The center portion is the megagametophyte. <clears throat> this is the embryo, little torpedo shape there. Here's the megagametophyte from the outside. And this red layer, this is the seed coat, a fleshy seed coat. So when you look at these things, they're gonna look like fruits to you because you're used to ha seeing fruits being the fleshy part of a, of a reproductive structure, <laughs> right? Like a tomato, the tomato is a, is a fruit. I mean, technically it's a fruit. We'll learn about what that means. Technically it's a fruit as we go on. But in this case, it's not. The fleshy outer part of this reproductive structure, of this dispersal structure, that's seed coat. So that's all seed, a fleshy seed in this case. And when I say a dispersal structure, I mean that there's a reward there for animals. Animals come and they, can, they chew away that outer coat or they come to eat that outer coat and they may, if they're effective at that, they might leave some of the, I'm sorry, if they're not effective at that, that is if they're not a really good predator, they might leave the embryo inside and the embryo can start growing that, but they've carried the seed away from its parent plant in that process. So the seed coat can form that attractive nutritive function for organisms who then carry the seeds to another location. So just to remember, remind you how that happens, there's an intermediate stage of the formation of the cone. This is the megastrobolus. And this has young seeds. They're not mature yet. They'll get a little bigger. And there they are, young seeds. They are on the megasporophylls. And again, this is zamia. And we know that because the megasporophylls are peltate. I want, I don't know if I want to draw the life cycle. Um, I want to make sure we have time to do our next group. We have one more group to do for lab today. This is, uh, the life cycle of the cycadophyta is a typical dibionic life cycle. It's got a couple unusual things about it, but not terribly unusual. Of course, we have the haploid on the top, the diploid on the bottom, meiosis on the left, fertilization. on the right, and if we ignore the fact that there's a very specific morphology in the haploid stage, that we've just gone through that, the structure of the molecule and all of those things, 
what we would draw on the top of this life cycle is pretty much like what we have drawn on any dibionic life cycle. We'd have a mega gametophyte. A microgametophyte. Which would be the pollen grain. And we could write, we could write pollen tube in there if we wanted to, but you've got the idea. I'm just trying to sketch this out in the very roughest way so we don't take too much time on it. Fertilization leads to the zygote and then to the sporophyte. And now we could, here's the first really different thing. Really, we should perhaps say, and even in this case, that we could have two zygotes. Let's try at least two arrows. And then we have a a female and a male sporophyte. Because the plant is dioecious. I'll write dioecious on there in a second. And then the female is going to have the <coughs> megasporophyll, megastrobilus. And the male is going to have the microstrobilus, etc. I'm not going to finish that out. You can do that. You've got you understand those things now. But this two sporophytes here is an indication that the <coughs> organism is dioecious. Two houses. So there's a separate plant that bears the megastroboli and another plant that bears the microstroboli. Separate on separate plants in this case. So that's the first plant we've seen that's dioecious like that. It's not going to be the last. It's the first one. In fact, our next group is going to be dioecious too. 